<laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Um, so here's a, uh, here's a quick outline of what I'm going to be talking about. You can read it a little bit, but I just wanted to uh, ask if there are any opening questions um, about uh, superconducting qubits or what I'm coming to. Uh, was that a hand? Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Uh, yesterday you were talking about there is a problem if you have um, inductances in a loop. Yeah. Uh, what about if you have like uh, Josephson junctions? In a loop? Right. Uh, I'm actually, it's not quite, it, it's sort of a, it's something I'm going to say right here, which I didn't put in the outline. I did have that left as a loose end, and I'm about to, uh, in the next minute, to, uh, to explain that. Um, so good. Uh, so I, I am. I'm wearing a microphone. I've got something in my pocket. The thing in the pocket has uh, some green light on it. Uh, is it is it loud enough? I don't know. But that's not my department. Uh, um, okay. So uh, let me indeed say that uh, we're about to apply the things that uh, I was teaching yesterday. Except I have uh, a few more. I have the, the indeed the exact item that was just brought up in the question. What do you do with uh, loops uh, of you know, continuous uh, superconducting order parameter all the way around the loop? And uh, we need that for a few applications. I'm, I'm not going to immediately go to transmons. I'll spend time on a couple of other qubits just uh, for exemplary purposes. But I will spend a lot of time on transmons, which will sort of negate all the beautiful work that I did yesterday, because the transmon is, from a circuit point of view, the absolute simplest circuit. And uh, it's, it's uh, had a great run. I mean, it's, uh, it's had, uh, we, we've gotten a lot of mileage out of a two-element circuit. Uh, but maybe, maybe that won't be always the case. So you know, we're here to learn some basic theory. So, uh, and maybe the theory will be helpful in some newer uh, qubits. Um, I'll get to how you go from a physical structure to circuits. Um, I mean, we often just uh, write down without thinking, oh yes, there's a resonator, LC, and there's a qubit, I have some Josephson junctions and so forth, and they're coupled, well, somehow, maybe it's a capacitor, but I'll, I'll explain why that's not actually guesswork, where, why that can actually be derived from sort of first principles, and these the sort of the black box quantization, although I'm not going to do the quantization part of it, it's just the black box uh, representation is a better word for, what, for the part I'm going to be talking about. And then we'll get finally to actually how you do gates, one qubit, qubit gates and two qubit gates in uh, the popular circuit quantum electrodynamic um, architectures uh, which are presently in use. Uh, there's, a, there's another part of this uh, axiomatic approach which I decided to bump to uh, my next lecture which has to do with non, non, uh, axiomatic non-reciprocity. So I, uh, you, you have to wait a little longer if you've been uh, interested in that. Okay, so indeed the part that I didn't finish last time was I had a little sketch circuit, which I'll reproduce here. Maybe I could make it bigger because uh, there's not going to be much else on this board. And uh, here's a, uh, I, I don't suggest this circuit for a qubit, but here's some loop and it had a lot of other stuff in it. But I claim that you had to do something new uh, if you had such a loop. Um, and and you have magnetic flux through it. And I'll just kind of announce this as a couple of rules. Um, and I'll, you know, I'll state you can derive these rules. But the motivation of these rules is that this uh, phi external has to be represented uh, by some vector potential. Or uh, if, you, if you do describe it by, by a vector potential, the, uh, the main uh, fact about it, about that vector potential, should be that if you, hmm, well, this, uh, let me find some uncrumbly uh, colored chalk here. Um, if you take in space any loop around this, and you integrate, uh, you do a line integral of the vector potential. So in blue, I've got the vector potential a uh, dot ds integrated over any loop containing this flux, so, uh, and I will put it, say, uh, through the elements of the circuit itself, this should be equal to phi external. And any other choices about A constitute a gauge choice. Uh, but I'm going to just, I'm going to fix the gauge uh, in the following way, that I'll, I'll, I'll pick a gauge which is sort of a string gauge or a cut gauge. I'm not sure if there's a real name for this. Um, 
but you're free to uh, attach a string to this uh, uh, vector potential. I'm sorry, to this uh, flux line. Let's um, let me separately draw the flux line. And suppose you'd have a gauge which has the property that a is non-zero uh, only on some string leaving this uh, flux line. Um, and that can work, th that can satisfy this, and that's all I'm going to insist upon, or all we, we do insist upon about this. This is a pretty singular gauge. It has to be a delta function along this line, so that when I pass through it, the integral is only non-zero right on this line. And then the recommended gauge will be such that you, um, you construct sh such sheets um, um, whenever, or, or there has to be a Josephson junction in this loop for this to make sense. And you should pass this sheet, or this string, it's a sheet if you think three dimensions, uh, you should pass it, so to speak, through the, uh, through the junction, you know, like right through the oxide, you would say, so that the vector potential becomes uh, part of the, uh, well, there's an integral, no, I, I shouldn't say it this way, it becomes part of the gauge invariant phase difference um, from, of the superconducting phase from one side to the other. And in this case, since I have uh, two Josephson, Josephson junctions, I'm free to pass uh, two such sheets out from this uh, flux line. And the, the amount that I put into one versus the other is up to me, and it's a gauge choice, in fact. Um, and the physics, I'll write a gauge-dependent um, prescription for the potential, or, or the modification of the Josephson potential that comes from the presence of these vector potentials. And it's understood that this alpha that I've just introduced, uh, that is uh, how much weight to give this sheet versus this sheet, will not affect the physics of this Hamiltonian. Uh, it will show up as a change of coordinate systems, in fact, if you t talk about the, uh, the classical dynamics. <clears throat> and then the rule will be that uh, the new uh, UFI contributed by this will be um, for, for, again, uh, uh, for each Josephson junction in term will be, will be uh, e sub j cosine uh, phi, uh, by which I mean, you know, phi 1, 2, the phase difference, uh, minus um, alpha phi external, I guess 2 pi, sorry, 2 pi alpha over phi 0. So that's the prescription. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll put this into use in, in the very first qubit example. Uh, a comment about this, this adds some you know, new global constraints to, uh, to the writing of this potential uh, that one has to be careful about. For example, I've run into this rather recently. We always say, and I'm, I'm not going to do this, uh, I'm not going to work out this example, uh, but we say that this situation um, so here is a, just a small loop with two Josephson junctions in a larger circuit, and you put a magnetic flux into it. Uh, you will see that you then get a, a sum of two terms um, as the potential energy, and the usual thing that you say is that this gives you a tunable Josephson junction, uh, a tunable Josephson effect, a tunable E sub J, um, in in that it will have some structure like the following. It'll say cosine. Uh, phi uh, 2 pi phi external over phi 0 and then cosine phi 1 minus phi 2 and this is maybe the absolute first thing that anyone ever worked out about these things this is the so-called squid you know law um, it's the basis of it being a magnetometer and if you had come to a lecture in the 1970s about these devices this would have been the main story in fact um, but this is not necessarily correct, or one has to be careful. If this is part of a larger structure that has some other junctions, then this can actually be wrong, um, or in the sense that um, you have to see that it's compatible with all the loops. What am I trying to say? That when I put one of my sheets in here, I, I've passed it through here, uh, but it's not out yet. You know, it's, it's not out of the, of the network yet. I have to find another place to pass it through, so I may pass it through here. And so the presence of a, a flux deep inside the circuit can affect what I, want to, what I need to write as the, um, as the Josephson characteristic of a junction far away. Um, 
So this is a rule that one has to be careful about. And it means that you can't simply take this unit and just take it out and replace it by this. Uh, that will not necessarily be correct. And I've even run into qubits recently where that happens. So you have to respect the non-local nature of this prescription. So this is surely the least classical, you know, the, uh, the electrical engineer who was carefully following my lecture would get stuck at this point, says, I don't believe it. You know, what's this nonsense about, you know, fixed fluxes? First of all, I don't think it has anything to do with uh, the dynamics of the circuit. And he would then express his irritation that I wasn't talking about voltages, which is all that anybody ever uses. You know, that these weird, you know, time integrals of voltages, why should they be important? Okay, but that's where the physics of superconductivity uh, tells you that you have a few weird rules like this. Uh, this is still, by the way, provisionally, or we use this all the time, and you just have to check that you don't have trouble like this. But this is a super useful fact that you can get an effective element which has a, uh, an effective Josephson energy which is tunable by an external knob. And that's used all the time in current geometries, in current uh, architectures. Yes? Yeah. But so here, did you, there's some cancellation and the argument of the cosine became a I have to do a one trigonometric identity. Right. Sum of cosines equals, you know, uh, some product. But that has it more generally so that the arbitrariness of alpha cancels out. Oh, it will indeed. Yes, it will. Except for it. It may, you may have some, some of it stuck here still, but it won't matter. It's just a displacement of what you call the origin of, of a coordinate system. So indeed, I'm not working it out. And you know, one has to be, take care of exactly questions like this. Um, but uh, I mean, I give assurance that this uh, is a gauge invariant uh, prescription. Oh, the other thing is that you can, um, you know, small, uh, uh, you know, addendum to this thinking. If you have a loop, let's say back to this case, if there's a capacitor through here, you can say, um, I'm allowed to put my, uh, my string gauge straight through the capacitor, and uh, that's how I can tell it doesn't do anything in that loop. Because uh, some, you know, this, uh, the dynamics of this only depends on time derivatives of the phases. This is a, uh, a time independent thing. Now, you can ask, what about, what if I actually apply time dependent fluxes? Someone asked that. And uh, I've, I haven't built all the correct axioms so that I can stand here and exactly say that. It's on my list of things to fix up about this lecture, even though I've been giving such lectures for some years. But I, I realize that that one should fit into this axiomatic story as well. Um, and time-dependent fluxes should give additional effects because they produce electromotive forces. Oh, yeah, yeah, I always do this. Sure. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, I agree. Um, I, I always have to... I, I always uh, forget that, that indeed I want the cosine, the version of the cosine that has a minimum at zero, uh, which is otherwise known as minus cosine. Um, okay, good. Now, I, as I said, I want to uh, now immediately proceed to some examples. So um, uh, just as a sort of, of historical interest, um, I'm going to talk about a qubit that was actually uh, the great favorite of uh, the laboratory here. I'm pointing sort of vaguely in that direction to point to the NIST laboratory, in fact. That way? No, that's Jilla. Isn't that, that's Jilla, right? But, huh? Uh, it, NIST is all, okay, then I'm turned around. Okay, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay, I, I get it, I get it, yeah. Um, uh, anyway, yes, NIST. Uh, so the, I'm going to talk about the phase qubit, basically. Um, not a big favorite these days, but uh, ex at least uh, exemplary of uh, the principles that I've just introduced, and not a bad qubit, just not really as good, finally, as, um, as some other qubits. So let's do the uh, phase qubit. 
uh, I guess you might say this is the first application. Um, it was indeed the favorite of uh, the, the pre-Google John Martinez, pre-Google, pre-Santa uh, Barbara uh, John Martinez. Uh, well, not, no, at Santa Barbara they were still probably doing it. Pre-Google for sure. Um, okay, so the phase qubit is a real simple object. It's um, just a capacitor with a Josephson junction and an inductor. There were even earlier versions of it where you actually put in a current source, but it was understood that um, this was better. It, it's very hard to make a good current source that is plagued by other problems. So it tends to be avoided, even though it's a very simple thing axiomatically. And we are going to put a flux here. And I'll even talk about some ideas of what happens when you change this flux adiabatically. So no real dynamics, but you want to understand uh, how you can uh, modify things by starting at a certain flux and then changing it uh, to change the characteristics <coughs> of this circuit. OK, so uh, we, we know the Hamiltonian. I have it prosaically written out here. Uh, I guess I will write it. Um, so the Hamiltonian operator uh, is. Uh, minus, uh, um, actually I don't even like my notation here uh, anymore, but uh, yeah, let, let me uh, actually on the fly say, we'll say uh, E sub C uh, Q squared uh, plus, and then some these constants E sub J uh, cosine, uh, but now I indeed have to be careful, phi. There, there's only one node here, right, phi? Or, or there are two, but this one's the ground node. So there's phi. But it's uh, minus, I'll call it phi external. That is, I'll uh, make it immediately a dimensionless quantity according to uh, uh, the full dimensional quantity is over there. So it's proportional to this external flux. And one flux quantum's worth uh, winds this by 2 pi. Uh, that's, of course, an aronov bohm effect, that uh, one flux quantum is equivalent to nothing uh, in superconducting uh, uh, systems. And then plus, um, I guess the full thing is uh, phi sub 0 squared over 2 pi squared, and then L um, phi squared. And now we look at uh, the possibilities given by this. I did the sign again. Uh, so uh, well, at least I caught it myself after a few seconds. Um, so a good sketch of such a thing is to say, well, you have something parabolic. So it's, uh, it has an envelope that's like a harmonic oscillator. Uh, but you, in addition, have a uh, cosine potential. And that's a fair rendering of the situation. Now, there are these uh, three energy parameters. So there are two dimensionless parameters that determine the uh, structure of this potential. So I've chosen one where, um, well, th this is not a small modulation. Uh, or another thing to say is that it's a, the cosine potential produces indeed a significant barrier uh, from one minimum of this cosine to the next. It's uh, uh, it varies, or the you know the strength of the cosine potential, or the of the quadratic potential, uh, varies, or or takes several uh, two pi's of winding before it's significant compared with the cosine. If you want to put it that way, now the actual actual position of this minimum is dependent upon the uh, phi external. So I've guessed this sketch was for um, I don't know where to put it here. Phi external equals zero. This axis, remember, is phi itself, so it's our dynamical variable. <coughs> so and when we do the quantum mechanics of this, we'll expect that there are some energy levels. And we will uh, work in a parameter re regime where these are pretty well localized. Um, so where at least the first several levels uh, are wave functions that are almost completely localized uh, to the to the first well. Of course, uh, then there are eigenstates in addition that live in these other wells, um, mostly. But then with tunneling, uh, uh, there, there's some small amplitude of that those eigenstates to live in the neighboring uh, wells as well. Um, now, this is already a kind of qubit. And with a little bit of a change of parameters, um, where this energy level spacing is a bit bigger than what I've shown. Uh, this is a, uh, has, has a new life as the so-called fluxonium qubit. 
so actually it's by no means dead. Uh, this is a sort of specialty qubit that ha still has uh, definitely uh, some advocates and there's definitely real research continuing to go on. Uh, but the particular style in which it was used for the um, uh, phase qubit is, I'll say, a bit obsolete, but definitely illustrative of, of uh, what, um, uh, of, uh, you know, a method of employing this qubit uh, or showing the variety of things that you could do. So the idea was to do this, and, but instead of using these as the qubits uh, directly, um, you would do the following. You would actually ramp up this slowly. So let me do, do it so that these um, uh, vary in the negative direction. So I think this is where I'm going to get into a bit of trouble. But, uh, so you have to think of this whole cosine characteristic as sort of uh, shifting around here. And uh, suppose that you've started in the ground state. So here we are. And you wind until you've, you've gone even, you've gone 2 pi. And so uh, if the system evolves adiabatically, then the new state of the system will be over here. Uh, you know, this connects smoothly up to, um, uh, to these levels. So this is when phi external, phi external is 2 pi, so a flux quantum. The spectrum has come back exactly to itself, but the state has not, because uh, the, or the idea is that there's been no relaxation. There's only been adiabatic evolution of the state. Uh, up to here. And you do that actually maybe one or two more times. I think in this sketch once more is enough. So you go all the way to phi external of 4 pi and then our uh, state is up here. And that uh, process was in fact the um, initialization. So the qubit uh, that was selected for these were these two levels, 0, 1. And so here's, so what I've just described is an initialization. Uh, so the adiabatic ramping of this threading flux by a couple of flux quanta to bring it up to this indeed excited state, uh, but one with quite a long lifetime. Um, is there a question over there? No. Uh, oh, there is, okay. Um, Right, uh, indeed, that's what I'm getting to. It's or that's part of, the, or the question is, why did he, why did he, you know, John Martinez or other workers in the flux phase qubits do that? Why was that a worthwhile thing to do? Uh, it provided both a good um, modification of the spectrum. The idea was here; it was uh, too harmonic, and so it faced the problem of the harmonic oscillator that it was not easy to cleanly address the lowest two levels. Uh, by the time you're up here, this is significantly less harmonic, so that the, uh, the two level in this well uh, is, uh, the, the difference between the, the one, two frequency is much smaller than the zero, one frequency. So it became much easier to address, so that you would, uh, by applying uh, uh, a tone, and uh, I should immediately say, and that's gonna come up very soon, uh, applying a tone in circuit language really just means doing that, having a modulated voltage here, and um, uh, that would will uh, apply uh, just as in as you think in optics will uh, cause transition or Robbie transitions between uh, the two states that are separated by the frequency of this tone. Um, now there was another good thing about the two level, uh, which was connected to how you read this out. Um, these two states are not very distinguishable. If you have something um, that is sensitive to supercurrents, for example, uh, th there's not any easy way of reading out directly whether the state is zero or one, and that's good. It means that the environment is not, uh, is not decohering these two states very badly. And the scheme of readout was the following. I, I actually forget, I'm, I'm going to state one way, and I can think of two ways, and I don't remember which way it was done, actually you apply a tone uh, which goes from one to two. So I'll write this over here, readout procedure. <clears throat> apply uh, omega one, two tone. Um, and, and do it as a pi pulse, say. 
so that if the state had been in the one, it would be rotated up to two. So now the qubit would be mapped into the zero two state. Uh, but what immediately happened, this barrier was tuned or chosen so that the lifetime of the two state was very short so that it would in fact tunnel out and then it would end up in this sort of quasi continuum over here uh, because in fact there are the uh, energy levels uh, due to all of these lower lying parts of the potential are very dense up here. So it would get up into here and it would uh, decay and would in fact end up somewhere down here and uh, that provided a real macroscopic distinguishability. It really affects the expectation values of currents in these loops. And so by a pretty crude measurement like uh, magnetometry, squid magnetometry, you could distinguish um, which state it had been in. Of course, you've destroyed the state. So, um, so that's a summary of the method, you know, circa 12 years ago for how you would read out this qubit. Question? Uh, so maybe I didn't understand this, but if the height is so close that even the second eigenstate is close to the top, yeah. uh, don't we expect that the eigenstates are not localized, rather they're cat states or um, these are still, uh, uh, well, uh, let me see. Uh, a good point of view is these are very, very narrow resonances. Um, I mean, all of the eigenstates of these are, of this whole system are discrete. But over here you have a kind of qu quasi-continuum, uh, co something close to a continuum. Nevertheless, there are eigenstates that, or there are states, uh, that if you initialize them in this well are very long-lived because they have to tunnel in order to get into this quasi-continuum. So, uh, you know, the way I like to say it, you, you intentionally made a kind of radioactive qubit. Um, it does have a finite lifetime, but long enough so that it was possible to do uh, plenty of experiments on it as a qubit. Um, and it, you know, the barrier, you know, the physics of barrier tunneling was such that the lifetime in the zero and one state were quite long, but two was immediately orders of magnitude shorter. So they're not eigenstate, but they're relatively long They're a kind of quasi eigenstates or resonances is what would be they would be called in uh, well like in nuclear physics but if you have a resonance that lives for seconds then that's as good as uh, for infinity for many purposes um, okay so I think that's all I have to say about the uh, the phase cube and I I could I have a little story written down here about the flux cube but I think I'll skip right on to um, the uh, the uh, indeed celebrated qubit, the one that we've had with us for years and has driven a lot of our progress, which is the uh, the transmon. Yes. So, uh, maybe I mean something. So phi is not compact. Is it? Uh, that is correct. I, I've barely said the word compact. I think uh, no, indeed. But I, I'm very soon coming to that. So maybe I'll address that. So uh, right, phi is a variable going from plus infinity to minus infinity in this theory. And uh, I haven't indeed articulated any rules yet for whether you should sometimes consider it compact. It would be a very strange to call it compact in this case because we conclude that the potential energy is different uh, in the phase equals zero state compared with the phase equals two pi state. So it would seem uh, pretty much impossible to call it compact. Um, but um, the issue of compactness uh, I would address in the following way, that if you have really an isolated Josephson junction, so this is compactness, and uh, these words were coming in about two minutes uh, concerning uh, the Cooper pair box and transbonds anyway. Um, if you have a, a Josephson junction in isolation, um, then indeed the physics of it says that um, nothing can tell the difference between calling the phase of this uh, phi versus calling the phase of this phi plus two pi. The, uh, the physical properties of this structure are identical in those two cases. And we would say, you know, when you really zoom in and look at the pieces of metal, that this whole piece of aluminum has a uniform superconducting order parameter phi, and this part has a unif uniform super, uh, order parameter, which we call zero. That's our reference phase. And um, there is no physical effect, nothing about the Cooper pair tunneling uh, or the energy of this system that knows anything about uh, whether this is phi or phi plus two pi or phi plus four pi. And so indeed that's a situation where the idea of being compact is uh, quite reasonable. And I'm about to invoke that. Uh, there are in fact long debates about this in, along the following lines. Well, 
uh, first of all, I say if I don't have this in isolation, if I have a, uh, um, an inductor here, for example, now suddenly I'm saying, no, it's not compact. Now, how can I do that? I've drawn a big fat inductor here because I want to make a point about this. Suppose this phi is, um, uh, I'd like to claim this phi is 3 pi, for example. And I'd like to say, actually, in this case, that's different from pi even though this junction doesn't know the difference. But all this, the rest of this metal does know the difference because the idea is that a, an inductor, a superconducting inductor, is uh, in a sense by definition one in which the phase uh, is not constant, that it actually is varying continuously as you go along this long piece of metal. And so if I look at it here, it's uh, 3 pi minus uh, you know, point uh, 0.4, and here it's 3 pi minus point 0.8, and I, I don't know if I'm doing it fast enough here, but somewhere in here it's 2 pi, and somewhere in here it's 1.5 pi, and here it's 0 0.2 pi, etc. So there's a really a continuous winding not only of the physical coil, uh, but of the actual phase itself. Uh, you can think of sometimes confusingly of the two going together. Of course, the number of turns of physical turns of the magnetic inductor is not the same as the number of turns of the uh, superconducting phase. So, but this twist of the phase, not of the uh, metal, but uh, not of the, uh, the coil of the wire, but the turning of the phase costs energy. Um, you know, in the, in the normal, in the theory of superconductivity, it's a gradient term in the, the simple field theory. And so that's the, that's the, pri that's the energy we're paying here uh, up in these higher parts of the well. So the system globally should not be thought of as compact. There's really a record uh, stamped into the inductor of how many phase windings you've taken to go from the bottom of, this, of the junction to the other. Yes? Okay, I mean, what that, uh, if the amplitude fluctuates down to zero, then I have some trouble. And indeed, you can say that, um, uh, well, if, if I say that I, I've got the system in this state where the phase is wound by a few windings, there are processes that will take it back down to zero, and including, co quote, coherent processes, they're really direct tunneling processes. So, and that's referred to as phase slip, and that can happen. So um, that, that means that, um, well, let's see how to say it. Uh, th there are actually multiple points of view here. Um, that is, you can say that uh, you can jam all this into one period of phi, into, from 0 to 2 pi. But then you have a, a sort of a multi-valued uh, uh, description of the dynamics. Um, now, there's another point of view, oh, okay, th this is connected with what I was going to start saying about transmons, which is that uh, the transmon is indeed the absolute stripped down circuit where you've uh, taken away this inductor. But then the, uh, the story goes a little bit like this. I quote, take away the inductor. Is there any real difference between taking away the inductor and declaring that that inductor has an inductance of a giga, a giga Henry? Um, it has a gigantic inductance, a huge impedance, so that only very rarely does any current actually even go through it. Um, in, and in that limit, um, this potential would, uh, would look almost perfectly like a cosine for peri many, many periods. Maybe after a million periods, it would start to rise a little bit. And the question is, well, is that, but that's still not compact. But how do you make the transition from one point of view to the other? And I'm not going to solve that for you here, but there have been excellent papers that explore that. It's a very subtle limit uh, saying that, or the difference between having a very high impedance inductance, which maybe the environment even provides, versus absolutely no inductor at all, and you know, infinite inductance. Uh, there's a paper by uh, Koch, Manucharian, Devore, uh, which really dig digs into this in great detail. And, um, uh, we're actually studying some of that right now. So, so I have many comments. I shouldn't go on too long about compactness. We're just going to declare it uh, in some circumstances. I always have what? 
No, no. If there's well, if there's only a tunnel junction uh, between t the the two metals, then uh, there is uh, not a gradient term. There is a there is a term. There's a term in the energy, but it's really periodic in the in the phase difference. Um, now I'm saying take that away. Now I'm now uh, I'm contrasting the two situations where that inductor is present, where you have a long metal connection between the top and the bottom node, versus one where that is not present and the, there's only tunneling of Cooper pairs from the top node to the bottom node. Um, okay, so let me make some progress on on the uh, you know actually telling you about the transmon. And I think in the first few, uh, first few words, I maybe wasn't going to plunge immediately into, well, no, it's already in like the, f the fourth line of these notes. I'm going to say, well, let's define, let's say that phi only lives on this interval 0 to 2 pi. Uh, you notice that takes us far away from the idea that, that these came from, from being magnetic fluxes, uh, which where the idea of compactness is a bizarre concept. Uh, and again, for my hypothetical, even very smart electrical engineering uh, engineer, he finds all of this quite peculiar. Um, okay, but so let's do this um, transmon. But in fact, it's not any different uh, from what it, uh, it, its original name was: Cooper pair box. And uh, for a while, anyway, I can. Uh, discuss them uh, as being the same. And they are all, in, uh, in fact, only different in parameters, but in a very profoundly important way. They are different in, in, in parameters. So we're going to look in great detail at this circuit. Um, sounds like there's, there's not really a lot to say, um, but uh, we'll, I'll find a fair number of things to say. So I'm going to still have a voltage here, but let me um, or I will separately at some moment later, well, maybe I'll draw it now. I'll, I'll draw this, but I won't use it. That there will also be the possibility of applying uh, some voltage at some, some frequency omega. But what I mean here is really a DC voltage. And that will be an important, you know, something that I have to use and comment upon uh, right from the beginning. Now, this formally has three nodes, but I've said these are constrained nodes. So my rules say that uh, these uh, do not count for the dynamics. So this is still uh, a system with only one degree of freedom, with one dynamical um, uh, coordinate. <clears throat> and uh, now I will have, um, uh, well, let, let me immediately write it. Uh, now I'll take a couple of lines. So um, the Hamiltonian for this is um, 1 over 2, now I'll say C plus CG. Um, this is CG. This is a gate potential. I, I will actually not, so this Hamiltonian will not include this term, but it's uh, also easy to include. But it will need, uh, I will need to include it in this effective capacitance uh, that appears here. And then I have the operator Q. But instead of Q squared, um, I have to use some of the rules that say what, what uh, does this node do. And it include you know it involves a, a constant phi dot at this node, and then if you go through the Legendre transformation, you find it appears this way: c sub g v squared. <coughs> so that we haven't done before, and then the usual uh, the rest: e sub j cosine phi. Um, uh, notice that this will be a circuit where uh, there's no story at all about. Um, Aronoff-Bohm uh, magnetic fluxes. There's no place in this circuit to put a magnetic flux that does anything. Um, uh, the, that, uh, the exception is when this is, I will draw this for a moment and then replace it. Often these are so-called tunable transmons. Not all labs use this. And uh, then uh, well, the story I told at the beginning is I put a magnetic flux just here, uh, but that has only the effect of locally changing the effective Josephson coupling. So it would appear as a knob on this, but it doesn't affect any other thing. Uh, this has no global consequences because this is such a small circuit. So the vector potential easily uh, you know, is drawn to leave the circuit. So, uh, okay, but we will mostly not, I, I will not invoke that in, in this discussion. 
So the main new thing is this, um, and I assure you, you know, a few lines of Legendre transformation will show you that this circuit has that effect. Um, so this should look uh, kind of familiar. This is, uh, you know, P minus uh, A, you might say, in ordinary uh, mechanics. So this is uh, acting like, uh, like a vector potential. Uh, the important word is like, and one should absolutely not get confused about, uh, uh, or, or this is a frequent duality and possibly confusing duality, that this is definitely produced by an electric potential, and yet in this effective Hamiltonian it's behaving like it's produced by magnetic fields. So there's an interchange of roles here. And um, now let us indeed, you know, on the basis of this whole argument that I gave uh, a moment ago, let us indeed declare that phi only lives on the interval 0 to 2 pi. Uh, as I said, that sounds innocent, and sure, this, this is periodic. That is, um, the energy, or the potential energy, is invariant with respect to going from 0 to 2 pi. And this is, well, this is a kinetic energy. Uh, but this has a profound effect. Uh, so note um, what that means is that um, uh, one should really remember that then this phi lives on a circle. And so it's dynamics on a circle rather than on a line. And on that circle, there's a cosine potential. So it's, uh, it's uh, lowest energy here and it's uh, highest energy here. Uh, the point that was made very beautifully in the founding papers on this subject is that this is indeed uh, uh, formally equivalent to a pendulum problem. Um, and uh, so the compact variable being the angle of the pendulum. Um, this behaves like a magnetic field on the pendulum. That's an unusual situation. Uh, but what we can say is therefore there's a, um, a kind of pseudo um, uh, hour enough bone flux. which is given by this term, because, you know, vectorially this is like a tangential um, term. It's a, it's a one-dimensional problem, but it's a vector potential. In, if you insist on vectorial language, it's a vector potential that's pointing along here. So this is the, uh, this is the vector potential in the, um, in the uh, circular gauge. Um, um, now, like uh, any such thing, oh, and I should say, of course, it was crucial that it be compact for this to have any significance, because if it were a line, and I put, uh, well, quote, quote, this Aronoff bomb flux to the side of a line, that doesn't do anything. I can gauge it away. So this is the main observation, that this cannot be gauged away. And it was, in fact, the reason why I didn't bother putting it in uh, here. I put on this AC potential to indicate that you can induce uh, Rabi transitions or Rabi uh, rotations. But I didn't bother putting in a, 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 a DC potential. If I had, I would have had a term like this. Uh, and I would have had to do a little calculating. But I would have uh, made a gauge transformation and brought it back to this form. Now, the picturesque way of, of expressing that is that the um, the, uh, the inductor, quote, shorts it out. Uh, what does that mean? Um, uh, that's uh, explained by uh, making one change of notations, but just noting, I, I somehow, oh, here's the, uh, here's, the, uh, here's the sketch, that if I have a non-zero V, uh, what you say is what it means is that there is, in fact, some charging of this capacitor. Um, and it's actually this charge that one can identify here. Now, I'm going to rewrite this in dimensionless form. Uh, I forget if I did this before. Uh, no, not in front of this audience. So uh, I redefine, or I introduce a new variable, which is the so-called Cooper pair number. Uh, which, let's see. Yeah, OK, I'll keep doing this. So it's now dimensionless. <coughs> and it now will have this property that was noted by one of you or anticipated by one of you that it will, because of the compactness, it will have uh, integer 
uh, uh, rather, it will not have a continuous spectrum anymore. It will have an integer valued uh, spectrum. Uh, so it will, quote, count Cooper pairs. So what we say is it counts Cooper pairs where? It counts Cooper pairs in this island, uh, in this region of the circuit. Uh, uh, that this island is ba almost isolated from the rest of the circuit except for the Josephson tunneling. But at any given moment, you can consider that to be a good quantum number. That is the number, the discrete, you know, integer number of Cooper pairs that are present in this part of the circuit. And so that's the, you know, the significance of the eigenvalue of that. And I suppose that's why it's called uh, n, little n. It becomes uh, uh, super confusing in a few lines if you go to second quantization, because then you want, you eventually introduce a number operator for an oscillator, and you'd like to call that n, but that's uh, a different n. Um, OK, so let's, um, where should I continue? Let me, I, I'll leave that uh, exhibited. Let me go all the way over here. <clears throat> so my change of notation now will be to uh, introduce this n, but make, make an n-like notation for the other part, this pseudo vector potential. So I have 2e quantity squared over 2c plus cg. And now I have uh, the operator n, the Cooper pair number operator. And then we'll call this another n, but it's called n offset. And it's not an operator. It's just this uh, c times v. Um, but it can be interpreted as the, um, the non-quantized amount of polarization charge that's present on this capacitor. Yes? How do I relate? Why, why do you say this is, a one of, this is related to the amount of charge that is contained in this? Uh, well, I, I, OK, I'm a little ahead of the story, perhaps. I mean, I haven't, uh, I mean, in a few lines, I'll derive the fact that it does have an integer valued uh, no, no, spectrum. No, no, oh. Somehow you relate it to charge in this part of the circuit in between the two condensators. Oh, well, I'll say that's, uh, that's a convenient interpretation. If you're not so happy with it, uh, leave it be. Uh, Well, then, yeah, that's indeed true, and I'm about to cover that case. If, if, there were, uh, if there were no Josephson tunneling at all, then this would be a truly isolated part of the circuit, and therefore it would make sense to say that there's an integer number of electrons present on that you know, isolated piece of metal. Uh, now, this will actually uh, cause that to be untrue, but, uh, but of course this, uh, the eigenvalues or the eigenstates of this Hamiltonian are not eigenstates of this N operator. So indeed, the eigenstates will not have a definite uh, Cooper pair number. Um, any other uh, thoughts? Uh, OK, so I'm back to I'm way over here. Uh, so I've, I've just done this notational change, um, and then plus or uh, minus this. But let me pl uh, minus, et cetera. But I'll, I'll, call, uh, I'll uh, do one more renaming. This is an energy parameter, and this is usually called the charging energy, EC. Uh, with a factor of four, I don't understand why conventionally it's you keep this factor of four somehow from the square of this two, um, n minus n offset squared, okay, minus ej cosine phi. So this is the uh, Cooper pair box or transmon Hamiltonian, and it has only one dimensionless parameter. But uh, uh, the key uh, uh, discovery or un the key to this story was, in fact, the understanding of the role of that one dimensionless parameter, because somehow the instincts of the original experiments was to start at one end of the, uh, of the uh, scale of this dimensionless parameter, and to realize it was really at the other end of the scale that, it was, uh, that things got useful and interesting. So uh, let's see. So let me uh, go through that. Uh, so the Cooper pair box uh, limit, Somehow I'd like to, somehow I got down on this board. Let, let me make sure I, I don't, I'm not going to draw anything below this line, right? Um, so the Cooper pair box limit which is historically how this got started was uh, to have a very small Josephson energy. So Ej much less than Ec. <clears throat> 
Uh, now, the eigenstates of this, as promised, are pretty simple. Uh, let's actually write them. So I'm going to declare that the eigenstates, the eigenvectors uh, of this, are indeed plane waves, e to the i m phi. But m is an integer, so um, m is from uh, z. Um, so 0, 1, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2. Um, uh, but the energy eigenvalues are dependent upon um, uh, an offset. Um, I don't think I have to prove this fact. This is just the usual free particle story. This is a momentum operator, and this is indeed uh, the eigenstate. This plane wave state is an eigenstate of momentum. But it has to satisfy this boundary condition. It has to be. Um, the wave function has to be periodic. It has to have the same value at 0 and at 2 pi. And that's what uh, causes this, uh, this uh, wave vector to be integer valued. Um, OK, but the eigenvalues are 4ec uh, n, uh, no, m, integer m, minus n offset squared. Now, this is, um, uh, well, if uh, n offset, if you consider n offset um, as a variable, but it is in fact just a fixed number, but let's suppose you sweep this voltage, this DC voltage, you see that this defines a kind of band structure. n offset is a, is a real valued uh, quantity, not integer valued. But in fact, this uh, set of eigenstates is a periodic in, um, in n offset with a period of 1. So uh, let me do a sketch of that. I think I mentioned, right? Uh, well, uh, one should say this is, of course, not literally the number of qubits. It's with respect to some offset, in fact, if you go to the real microscopic theory. You know, the island has uh, in huge numbers of, of Cooper pairs, I don't know, billions or something like this. And this is sort of counting differences from, from what? Well, some, from a kind of neutral point, uh, electrical, uh, electrically neutral point. Uh, so you should draw uh, parabolas. So this is the uh, so-called la empty lattice approximation of uh, simple solid state physics. And uh, it's always a real challenge to make a usefully accurate sketch on the board. I think I've managed it pretty well. Um, OK, so there we have it. So those are the eigenstates. Now the idea is I can uh, fix an offset to be whatever I want. So let's. Uh, Let's maybe fix it here, maybe fix it at 1 half. And uh, then I have uh, the interesting situation that the first two eigenvalues are here. So these are doubly degenerate. And then the next one, next pair, the next doubly degenerate pair are up here. Now, um, that was uh, assuming ej was 0. Let's bring back ej. Uh, this is the usual situation. You know, Remember what happens at the edge of a Brillouin zone in the nearly free electron problem, and then you've got this exactly. And uh, what it says is this is a perturbation that does hardly anything until you get to uh, a crossing, and then it just uh, does an uncrossing of these bands. So I'll draw a few of them. Uh, good. So the original thought was to say, well, we work here. That's great. Here's a 0, and right next to it is a 1. And then I, my 2 and my 3 are way up here. So at least I have a real great uh, sort of spectral isolation of the first two levels. Um, now, this turned out to be uh, not so great. Uh, and several years were wasted. I shouldn't say wasted. I mean, uh, if Rob Sholkoff's original a set of graduate students had a real good education in you know, really doing hard experiments. And, uh, but this turned out to be really too hard. And the story that we eventually, or, or we came to understand, was that there was unfortunately a kind of dynamics to n offset. So that n offset, um, I mean, we declare it's just due to the presence of some battery in a capacitor. But um, uh, these are really small, I mean, this periodicity of just two uh, electrons of one Cooper pair um, it means that even very tiny effects, and in practice, you know, there's an insulator here, and there are some uh, charge centers, or there's some electrons that have some uh, dynamics in the insulators, or something like that. Uh, but the consequence of that is that um, an offset can be observed to vary as a function of time. So here's a time axis, 
and here's the uh, an value of n offset. And it varies, and unfortunately, it varies quite a bit. Um, so it's, um, and then you recognize that if this is what's going on, and it's due to quote classical things, uh, very microscopic things, but things which are effectively classical. So it's effectively that at this very small scale, the electric potential at this island is in fact varying. This is maybe some one over f uh, spectrum of, uh, of variation. Um, so you shouldn't say it's now a quantum operator or something like that. Um, but this made this point of view completely untenable. So if you travel up and down here, even rather slowly, this energy splitting is varying by a huge amount. And uh, so it was never a usable qubit, according to this concept. Um, but then the, the uh, great idea was to say, well, why did we go with this limit? Uh, th there was a clear reason, which was that they just wanted to grow the absolute smallest possible thing, that, that that would be instinctively the thing that should be most quantum mechanical. So um, uh, basically what was made was something where the capacitance was equal to the capacitance of this little nanoscale uh, junction. And uh, that's what made the, it made the E sub C very big. And the insight was to say, make the E sub C smaller by making the capacitance bigger. Uh, remember, there's a, well, somewhere on this board is that there's an inverse relationship between the capacitance and this charging energy. Instinctively, that makes sense. If the island is very small, it takes a lot of energy to shove a charge onto it. The, so the solution is make the island much bigger, make its capacitance much bigger. And that takes us to the transmon situation. So, um, all right, now I've been strolling around and... Uh, gesturing and now the question is where did I leave uh, the relevant notes? Ah, here they are. So, absolutely yes, sure. So for the base qubit back there, then principle, should we add like a cosine of pi q term? A cosine of q term? Uh, well, that's an interesting concept. I mean, it, that is a real concept. There's a so-called phase slip junction. Um, uh, well, that, that could be a very long discussion, I don't know, because I didn't introduce that axiomatically even, so I'm not prepared to even uh, say that such a thing exists. And it's actually understood to only exist as a sort of derived uh, object, that is, it, it comes from this toolkit basically in a certain regime. This phase slip qubit is another kind of qubit, uh, which I was, however, not going to put into this lecture. But let, let me just comment that what the... Uh, what uh, the uh, what the question came from the audience is, uh, could you have a new kind of circuit element, uh, which actually has a little symbol like that, where you have some uh, cosine of maybe q over 2e? Question, question. And the answer is yes, sort of. Um, it actually does involve really endowing the, this n offset with uh, quantum properties. Uh, so uh, anyway, that, that's a little bit of a story. I'm not sure what motivated you to ask that question. Oh, OK, uh, that to kind of some restore some true duality between these, these things. Um, Uh, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it's basically okay. Well, I'm I'm coming to the part of the story that even here, where I put some splittings into these, uh, this lower band looked sort of like a cosine. It's not yet, but it's uh, it is of course periodic, and uh, if I turn up E sub j a little bit more, it will get pretty much closer to a cosine. And that's the cosine q. Uh, but then the q is a kind of requantized version of n offset. I think um, I'm no expert on that, so I can't comment. I mean, it's definitely not become a mainstream qubit anyway. And it's, um, as I say, from that point of view, it's not a fundamental concept itself. It's something that I get as a sort of effective dynamics 
uh, from this, you know, these constructions. Anyway, let, let me, however, go on. Uh, so I finally have gotten to the idea of transmons. Uh, now I've gotten to the moment in the lecture where I need more board, so I'm going to get rid of my outline. Where have I gotten to anyway? I'm not, uh, no, I'm not very far, actually. Okay, but I have another whole uh, lecture. Um, Good. Okay. So the the real insight was to um, well uh, the way I'm going to say it. Yeah. Okay. I um, make uh, e sub c a lot smaller, uh, and the target turns out to be a ratio. Uh, let's see, e sub j over e sub c of at least ten, but actually tending up to more like fifty or so. Um, so the exact opposite order of large parameters. Uh, where this is heading is the following, that now um, starting from this perturbative picture, I'm turning up these gaps um, by changing this ratio. So I, if I do that, I'll have a very strong band repulsion. And I'll sc start getting dispersions where at least the lowest band is quite flat. Um, so the gaps get as big as the, uh, as the bands themselves. And uh, what you find is that, and I'll justify this from a couple of points of view, that uh, the bands with respect to, um, to uh, an offset turn out in this regime to be very, very flat. And I won't even bother drawing any dispersion for the first few. And then I find, finally, when I get somewhere up higher in the spectrum, they start to modulate a bit. Uh, but the, uh, the thing that was considered dramatically good about this is that it now completely solves this N offset drifting problem. Uh, because uh, you focus, say, on this uh, omega zero one. <coughs> and, uh, and an offset is drifting all over the place. But basically, omega 0, 1 becomes independent of an offset. And um, it leads the, uh, it becomes a dramatically uh, uh, more coherent qubit. I mean, it is not suffering from the noise, in, uh, uh, or th this noise, it becomes basically completely immune from. Um, it, it introduces other problems, but um, but the uh, uh, well, they are turn out to be solvable. It, it's a, a not as e not as easy a qubit to measure. It turns out because uh, for the Cooper pair box, measurements of charge it turned out was enough to be able to measure the state of a qubit. Uh, these uh, the zero and the one of this qubit are really indistinguishable from the point of view of charge. So you have to have a more sophisticated idea for how to measure them. Uh, and there's another problem that comes up as well. Um, I have to re-sketch this in a few different ways, because it's missed one feature that uh, I need to discuss. So let's go back. Uh, it's easier, although we've, uh, we've uh, you know, now got in our heads that this is compact. So I should draw it on a line. But I can't draw a cosine potential on a, I mean on a, on a, uh, on a circle. So I'll unwrap the circle, but keeping in mind that 2 pi is really the same as 0. And uh, all this rest of this is redundant to uh, sketch any more than one period of this. Um, but what, what one can confirm is that this limit corresponds to a case where the energy level spacing is the omega 0, 1 is much, much less than Ej. I'll give you a formula. It's easy to write a formula for it, and I'll do that in a moment. Here's the height e, ej. So it means that we're back in the case very much like the, um, the phase qubit. That is, that the eigenspectrum can be thought of, or the eigenstates can be thought of ones that are pretty well localized uh, to a relatively limited range of this, uh, of this phase, to much less than 2 pi. And the idea of it there being independent of an offset is the usual one that if you have a band problem and there's no tunneling from one unit cell to the next, um, then, it, then it becomes independent of wave vector. You just have localized states. 
So the, the sensitivity to the N offset is a function of how much this tunnels through the barrier to, uh, you know, to the, uh, all the way around the circle, basically. And, uh, or, you know, in pendulum language, it says, uh, what's the probability that the pendulum will tunnel over the top to go uh, to, you know, back to itself, back to the low energy state. And you can, uh, this is the choice of parameters that makes this extremely unlikely. And um, so just to put some thoughts in your head, the, um, this independence, so the uh, degree of dependence you can calculate using WKB theory, for example. Um, it it uh, goes like an exponential, e to the uh, minus, and then it turns out there's an 8ej over ec. So uh, because it's up in an exponential, which is not surprising because it's a tunneling problem. Um, and this is applicable to the first two levels, that it has this kind of scaling. So you make this constant you know, large enough, uh, 10 or f especially 50, that this exponential of minus a small number is really suppressing this uh, sensitivity you know, enough so that you can totally ignore it. Yes? Yeah. To not have the harmonic. Right. The very first thing you said about flux because you don't want to get the phi external equals zero. Well, mm -hmm. of yeah. And the bane of this, this is the transmon qubit, is that it's uh, not very anharmonic. It, it's anharmonic, and uh, basically the uh, experimentalists decided they could live with a pretty small anharmonicity. And that this was the sort of new thought uh, that made them willing to go into this, I, I guess, uh, Devore and, and Sholkoff realized that they wanted to go into this territory because there was no other choice other than making a whole new kind of qubit. And they were going to have to live with this uh, uh, n pretty harmonic qubit. Um, and I think finally they have learned that even, you know, the, the, anharm the small anharmonicity of the phase qubit would have been okay if you were just more careful or uh, d dealt with the difficulties in a more serious way. Because um, indeed that is the problem um, that, uh, let me go over here, that the anharmonicity gets quite small. So let me uh, quote you a few formulas. So now we're back to this one period. We have uh, omega zero one, and here's omega zero two, uh, sorry, omega one two. Uh, this, if you work it out, is an energy spacing very close to, um, where the heck do I have it? Uh, uh, very close to square root of eight uh, E uh, C times E J. Um, you can confirm that uh, that does indeed put it globally, it's at a value quite a bit smaller than Ej itself. And then the next one, if you count up that much more, uh, the two levels a little bit lower, and the amount by which it's lower is just Ec itself. Um, now, the, the contrast is pretty big. This, I mean, in practical units, this might be five gigahertz, you can choose it to be right in that range. And this EC is in the range of, say, 200 megahertz. And that was scary to an earlier generation, but uh, say, well, 200 megahertz is a kind of reasonable anharmonicity, and it constrains you in the, in the ways in which you do Rabi flopping. You have to make sure that the, uh, the Rabi oscillations are done quite gently and, uh, and stretched out rather much in time so that the frequency of the drive, um, uh, you know, the, the duration of time that you apply a drive, you know, the AC potential, has to be long enough so that it's uh, longer than the inverse of this 200 megahertz. So it tells you that you have to do gates in 50 nanoseconds and not in 2 nanoseconds. Um, but you gain back so much in coherence that by slowing everything down, that was in, t in total a win. Okay, so this is, um, you know, all rather uh, qualitative stuff. Um, 
I will finally say that by these methods of Robbie flopping, but not just be by attaching any old tone generator and applying a tone, there are all sorts of sort of chirping effects that you should do and shaping, and there's something called drag, and I'm not going to go into any of that to uh, prevent, uh, I mean, th there are highly technical discussions of how do you really avoid leakage, how do you avoid uh, a very rigorously population in level two. Uh, in the end, uh, the one qubit gates, that were done, that have been done by that uh, means have, and this is not even a very fresh number, have a fidelity of something like 99.993%. Uh, so pretty good. Um, um, I, I think, I don't know if, if uh, there are certainly limitations to putting more nines on this. Maybe one or two more have been or could be put on. Turns out the big limits are in the two qubit gates anyway, so which I'm going to discuss now uh, and, and spilling into the following lecture. I know a few of you are from the, uh, uh, what was written in the, uh, in the sheet uh, or in the, uh, you know, in the web page about the participants, are a few of you from Rigetti University. Uh, so uh, is it uh, indeed a couple of you there? Yes. Uh, so I, I, was, I didn't know that Chad had started his own university. Um, <laughs> But you guys would probably be in a position to know if this uh, remains a good number, or maybe you don't even work too hard on improving it anymore because indeed the two qubit gates are the, are the tough ones. Yeah, I mean, that's good enough. Good enough, yeah, right. Uh, definitely, um, I mean, if all gates were of this, uh, this quality, we'd already be supreme, or whatever uh, musical groups we're supposed to be. Um, um, uh, anyway, but let's get to the subject of more extended structures. Um, I had a little, I had a whole song and dance about uh, how you second quantize this, but I, I bet you could do that without me prompting you to do it very much. Uh, the, maybe I'll say one, one or two qualitative words about this, that um, in the limit that we're working, this is really pretty close to a harmonic oscillator. Um, uh, and uh, you can do a basically perfect job of it, of saying that it's a harmonic oscillator plus an anharmonic correction. And the anharmonic correction, I can't really do this, anharmonic correction is, of course, proportional to uh, the fourth power of phi. And uh, this is, in fact, a kind of Kerr term in the language of quantum optics. And uh, it's very easy to build a quantitatively very accurate theory of the transmon just based on that. And in other words, completely throwing away the, the story of compactness. I so carefully constructed a compact store, uh, theory and said how important it was. But now that these wave functions are so localized to the first well, I can do anything I want, including uh, you know making up a non-compact theory for this, and it's fine, this quartic oscillator theory. Um, you know, is a perfectly good description of this. And um, then, you know, you can easily second quantize this and uh, these uh, terms appear as things that are like uh, uh, B dagger, B squared, you know, the four, four powers of, uh, of the bosonic operators. But let's not do that. I think uh, it'd be better if I get to the ideas of how this has um, made it possible to go on and, and do uh, two qubit gates, but also measurement. I've said nothing about measuring this, and these are, straight, from a straight por forward point of view, not easy to measure. Question? Yes, um, I think coming back to the previous question also, and also the, the, the phase qubit, so what are the disadvantages that now people are not working about that? Because I thought first just that it's not unharmonic enough, but now yep. that you talked about the other qubit that also is not as unharmonic as that. So well, I don't know. I think um, this particular method of using this potential and sitting and using the, its eigenstates up here um, uh, proved to be not coherent enough. I mean, I have not been quoting any things about the lifetimes, the T2 times, the T1 times. Uh, these had a very hard time getting to half a microsecond or so, which puts it several orders of magnitude short of the coherence times that you get with transmons. I think that was enough to kill it. Now, I don't, you could say, well, let's go back to here. Uh, we, th there, now we've learned we don't have to be scared of small anharmonicity. Maybe we can go back to here. And in a sense, that's what's been done. And there's a subject, as I said, of fluxonium, 
which is a revisiting of this uh, circuit, uh, but in a somewhat different parameter range. And that's uh, is an interesting qubit. Um, it, it then gets into the subject of how do you make, uh, how do you really make inductors? Um, you know, I've been pretending there are coils of wire, but that's not a good idea. And then that takes you into a whole art of making effective inductors using, well, other kind of superconducting effects, you know, thin, dirty superconducting wires. So that's a whole other specialty of how you make a good, you know, devices that if worked as, as large inductors. Uh, question here. Uh, no, well, the, the qubit is just the zero and one of this, of this Kerr oscillator, this anharmonic oscillator. It has the same value of any simple expectation value. So you're going to have trouble. Any of the traditional ways of measuring it with a magnetometer or an electrometer will fail, do fail. Uh, it's, okay, it's true. There is, an, uh, there is a, a fluctuation that you can try to measure. And in some sense, that's what it's going to do. But it does it... Uh, by shifting th it's those uh, added uh, you know, quantum fluctuations or difference of zero point fluctuations, the difference of quantum fluctuations of the two states that affect uh, the, if, uh, the frequency of a resonator that you measure. So it's a, you use a rather indirect process, uh, but which is ultimately based on indeed the fact that they have different expectation values of the square. I'm sorry, what? of say the fluxonium, the new, yeah. ooh, um, I don't know that they've, uh, I, I think potentially yes. Uh, I don't actually know good numbers for fluxonium. Anybody here a fluxonium expert? Um, it's, it's a very tiny community compared with, now we do sociology, you know, that there are just fewer groups working on it and they're not, they're not the ones who say we're going to build a quantum computer come hell or high water. So uh, I don't know that the focus has been so strong on super top fidelities in fluxonium. But I could be wrong. I don't know. Um, OK. Uh, and that, that's where it rests now. I mean, I know there have been designs in the last couple of years that, that uh, reduce the sensitivity to. Uh, uh, Okay, yeah, not, not yet another object. Okay, so uh, I wasn't going to get into that at all. But uh, yeah, zero pi qubit is about twice the complexity of, or, or kind of, uh, cir from a circuit point of view, twice as many circuit elements as, uh, as the fluxonium. And so complexity is coming back. Circuit complexity is coming back for good reasons. Uh, yes? So is uh, E0 or large in the space qubit as well? To like avoid errors due to space Um yeah, I, I don't know, actually. I mean, there was a certain preferred uh, set of parameters. Since the criteria is different uh, than for the transmons, I, I actually, frankly, don't know. Um, but I guess if e EC is large, then you increase the number of phase lifts that can happen. So. Uh, that's true. You, if you increase the kinetic energy, basically, yes, you increase the zero point motion of the, you decrease the mass, uh, yes, so that, you can't go so far in that direction. I, I would certainly agree with that. Okay, uh, I, I think, okay, I could, by, uh, in terms of uh, the sketch, I could say that indeed the parameters are chosen so that in this well, uh, there were only maybe three or four or five levels before the top of the barrier. And that, that's enough to work out, uh, you know, what EC had to have been. Uh, Keeping in mind, this is a much shallower barrier, uh, shallower well than the than the phi equals zero well, well by a factor of two, perhaps, or something like that. Um, I know I was supposed to give homework, so that there's your homework. <laughs> It's related to the uh, indeed the offset charge sensitivity. Uh, but with some important quantitative differences which ultimately show up in an exponential. So one should be careful about saying they're closely related. Uh, I mean in the sense that indeed there will be some formula like this, but I'd want to put a different factor up here than eight, I believe. Um, so but the parameter dependences will be uh, basically the same. 
Okay, um, let's see, where am I headed? Right, so I want to uh, describe what you have to do next, which is that um, to do some of the tricks that I mentioned, you have to put, um, uh, you have to put transmons in cavities. And this was initially done in order to have a f workable way to, read it, to do readout, but it was understood that it also has provided a route to an actual architecture for a multi-qubit structure. So I'll explain uh, several of those things sort of all at once. <coughs> so, um, but I will not get to something that I had in mind. Now this is very wet, so I'm not going to be able to do, do this anyway. Um, Okay, I, I give up on that. I have to find a dry eraser, pretty dry, and I have to erase somewhere else. I don't really need this now. Okay, so let's now, for the first time, uh, uh, say something about the actual sort of physical makeup of a, trans, of a transmon. And so uh, the first element I draw is a Josephson junction. See it? OK, because I, I need it to be at that scale to see the rest. So it's uh, these little bitty nanometer thing is just a speck. It's really, you know, like in the pictures you would get, uh, I showed last night a picture of uh, some quantum computer, less than a pixel is the Josephson junction, or even the two Josephson junctions. Uh, then you have uh, a piece of metal which is of sizable dimensions. And uh, what I mean by sizable is these, are these pieces of aluminum, say. Um, <coughs> and uh, I take as a number, it, it varies quite a bit, but maybe 100 micrometers or maybe even larger. So I'm, I'm many orders of magnitude, in, indeed larger than this scale. And I needed this, uh, um, this is needed to get the larger capacitance uh, to get into this uh, regime. And uh, so the, uh, uh, I, I believe actually, actually it's more typical, modern transmons are even bigger than that, I think, or hundreds and hundreds of nanometer, uh, hundreds of microns. Yes? So unfortunately, we'll come in for a second. Where's your, uh, Josephson junction? <laughs> oh, okay, I'll draw it again. There. As I said, it's one pixel. I, I mean, I can't do any better with a chalk than I can with a, with PowerPoint. It, it's, uh, it, uh, well, where it actually sits on here, it has to bridge between these two uh, islands. Uh, where it is is almost irrelevant. Uh, it almost has to do with, the, there's a tiny bit of inductance of this strip of wire, uh, but I think it's negligible enough that it, it really plays no role, and this thing can really be anywhere on the side in the middle. Um, but it physically uh, uh, realizes the thing that we would conventionally draw this way but a big contrast in the actual physical scales. Okay, so there's our transmon. Now, uh, the next thing that happens, and I'll, I'll do it in the, uh, uh, the 10 year ago style, so there are many different variants since then, uh, but you put this in a much larger structure. So let me, um, I need to put stuff right over this scale bar. Maybe I'll do it in color though. Um, there's another much bigger conductor, or longer, in fact, uh, which sits right near it in the uh, designs that are, uh, well, that first worked, that first, uh, you know, uh, did an, a suitable job of, of uh, you know, realizing uh, the waveguide coupling or the resonator coupling that I'm going to describe. So that this, this and then the, uh, the blue metal, which may also be aluminum, but it may, may also be a different metal, it's sometimes niobium or it's sometimes copper even, but then with a different geometry wh than what I'm sketching here. Um, so, and then uh, this is actually part of a large sheet of metal. So the typical thing is that you have a surface of a chip that has this quote blue metal all around, then you make sure that there's a slot in it, two slots in it, and then you fit the transmon uh, in, inside it. And then the physical dimension of this is I, I took a uh, take a particular example, 225 uh, millimeters. So, um, uh, so indeed, several centimeters of length. Um, so that's compared with the 100 microns. It's again a much bigger scale, and now we're at really macroscopic scales. Um, so uh, I, I can't do justice to that. That would have to run a long way. But what? What is actually typically done is this is meandered, but let me now write a different sketch. So 
The, um, so here's the transmon. Uh, that's the whole big uh, parallel plate capacitor thing. I'm now at, uh, well, I'm still, I'm still at magnification 10 or so, not, not at very big magnification at this point. Uh, and then the uh, coplanar waveguide, because uh, that's what this structure is called, uh, goes past it, uh, but then often does several meanders. So often that's the main thing that catches one's eye, and uh, maybe off on this side as well, and then ends. So its, it's net uh, travel length, I mean travel length uh, of radiation along this thing is this 225 millimeters, but it's wrapped up into a smaller space. But the meanders have no significance for the dynamics. The thing works the same as if it's just one long straight uh, line. Yes? Um, okay, uh, it's certainly the right order of magnitude. Um, well, let's see, 210, uh, oh, wait a minute, uh, I think I'm off by, indeed, I'm off by a, a decimal place. <laughs> um, uh, I want to say a few centimeters, and I guess to do that I have to put a decimal place uh, somewhere here, there. That's better, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Um, great. You, you get the awake prize. Uh, um, I, I get the asleep prize, actually. Um, okay. But it's still a big contrast. Uh, 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 anyway, I mean, you've seen the micrographs, and they look like that, but uh, stretched out straight, they should be these dimensions, uh, several centimeter lengths. Um, um, now, but they do come to an end, and um, the ending is actually pretty much like what I've sketched here. The inner conductor simply stops. Or it stops, and, um, but rather importantly, in many cases, it, it is interrupted. But then uh, there's quite nearby another section. So there's just a gap. Uh, so and this, then this cable continues. So you often see that it actually does, does continue and go off to the edge of the chip and goes to the outside world. So these are some elements that you saw in the, in the IBM chip, perhaps, if you were looking at the photo last night. And uh, then you, we'll also put more than one uh, transmon here and there on such structures. Now, I've come to the end of my lecture today, and I've, I've, uh, not, I've just barely started with uh, an explanation that will get me to so-called black box concepts for writing a circuit for this. Um, so it means I'll do less. I, I have to make sure to get to my story about uh, non-reciprocity. But uh, other than that, I will basically just resume with this, and uh, we will indeed get to the story of uh, how you do gates, including two-qubit gates and whole networks of things that will realize surface codes, maybe, um, with these building blocks. Okay, but we have a little bit of work to do before we get to those stories. Okay, thanks.